Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. The show is brought to you by Pariah Pickups, quality handcrafted guitar pickups made down in Detroit Rock City with lots of love. Check them out, pariahpickups.com. And this week, we welcome a couple more new members into the No Sleep Till Sudbury Vibration Nation Patreon family. Nancy Joe Ramsey and Mr. Mark Gratoli. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for supporting the show. Folks, if you want to support the show on Patreon, very simple. Go to patreon.com slash Brent Jensen Music. There's all sorts of fun stuff on there. Unreleased episodes, signed books, merch, behind-the-scenes photos, unreleased material, all kinds of stuff. Check it out. Patreon.com slash Brent Jensen Music. All right. Now, in addition to talking to the more well-known names in music. Long-time listeners of the show will know that I also love hosting artists who are up and coming that I think have something unique to offer. And as such, joining me on the show this week is singer-songwriter Nelson Sobral. Great musician, great human, great conversation. Check it out. Nelson, welcome to the show, man. It's a pleasure to have you on. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me, Brent. It's such a pleasure to be here. Good. Well, it's my pleasure to have you on. Thank you. <laughs> And I have slept before Sudbury. You have? Just to know. Just, yeah, for sure. How Road could trips, you? you gotta... <laughs> How could you? I just you got to get ready for the show, man. You got to get your sleep in. <laughs> so I'm usually so excited. Gotta... There's, there's just no sleep until Sudbury. <laughs> yeah, well, I see. I want to be excited when I get there. So you got to get a nap in, and then, and then there you are. So you're well-rested and you're ready to go. Exactly. Ready to rock. All right. So here we go. <laughs> So listen, I've uh, I need you to explain something to me. Okay. So you're a Toronto guy. You mm-hmm. grew, you grew up in Parkdale. Yes, sir. But you sound like a Tennessean. <laughs> so you don't you don't sound like a Toronto musician trying to sound like a Tennessean. You sound like mm. so explain how does that work, man? Explain that to me. Uh First, I got to shoot you back a question back. Is that because of my accent when I'm talking normally or my accent when I'm singing or both? You just sound, I love your stuff. You know, we were talking uh, earlier and and we'll get into your new single and stuff like that. But for sure, you got a great voice. You write great songs. I love your music. My point is that you sound super authentic. Thank you so much for that. It really does mean a lot to me. I I really do appreciate it. Um, And I got to thank my mom for that. (laughs) <laughs> he uh seriously she raised me on a on a good diet of music like i she woke me up i don't know if you remember back in the day 10 50 chum am uh was an oldie station like uh 50s and 60s stuff so yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and 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 she would have that cranked every morning that was my alarm oh, so wow. she would be doing her morning stuff like you know preparing food doing the things getting the day ready for the kids Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the first thing that I heard was like, you know, whatever it would be Tom Jones or Otis Redding or your know, Elvis or, or whatever, you know, Muddy Waters, like whoever they were playing and they played everything. Like mm-hmm. it was such a wonderful thing. So I grew up with a rich history. My mom was a huge Beatles fan, obviously still is. She met the Beatles when she was a kid um, and she raised me on a good diet of music. So to me, like I'm entrenched in, in like, you know, Wilson Pickett and, and uh, Aretha Franklin. So when I, when I sing, it's not that I'm, you know, I'm trying to set that's just all I know. I know how to sing like those people that I grew up listening to. I'm not trying to do anything other than just be me. And that stuff is so in, ingrained in me that like, I can't get away from it. It just comes out of you. It's natural. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's mm-hmm. fantastic, man. That's, that's a damn good thing. I'll tell you. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I thank her every day for sure. Well, credit yeah. to your mom. She's got good taste. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So Nelson, the new single is called Pendulum and it's mm-hmm. now available everywhere. It came out last month. There's a nice horn line in that tune, man. I like it. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I was saying earlier, I like your music. It's, it's imaginative in terms of the instrumentation that you use, I find. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, you're kind of like a, a triple threat that way you have a great voice you write great songs and you incorporate interesting instruments into the music and it, it, you know when you do that you're you're able to avoid sounding too kind of i don't know if mainstream is the word but too linear you know i i, I like surprises yeah. in music i like unexpected mo- modulations i like unique instrumentation stuff that kind of makes you go whoa 
That's cool. I wasn't expecting that. You know, and that's what you've got. Ear candy. Yeah. You got to have the ear candy, man. Again, I think that goes back to the point of like, you know, those old 50s rock and roll records had horns on them. Mm-hmm. They had horn solos. And the Stones in the 70s were like, they had like gospel singers with them and horn players and fiddles and harmonicas. So if a song is calling for something, I don't see why I shouldn't put it on there just because I'm playing a whatever type of music, a mm-hmm. guitar based music or whatever. You know, like when that part of the song was uh, under my fingers and I was writing the song, I heard horns in my head and I was like, yeah, man, well, I know a great horn player. Why would I not have horns on this? It, it just seemed kind of redundant not to. So I just did. Oh, it benefits the song. So this is the single, Pendulum. Is there going to be a, a record? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there's another single coming out in June, July. I got a baby on the way in June. So I Congrats. thought it would be a thank you. Thank you. I thought it'd be a great time to double up my, my, my workload with putting out another single around that good, time. Good thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> proper planning. Um, <laughs> so it'll be around June, July, depending on what the baby has to say for itself. And uh, yeah, so there'll be another single. And then later on in the year, I'll put a, uh, a third mm-hmm. and it'll be on the forthcoming album. That'll, uh, that'll be coming out early next year. You know, I've recorded tons of stuff, almost like two to three albums worth of stuff. And it's just a matter more of like putting together a group of songs that sit well with each other and not like, you know, just a bunch of songs, you know? See, that's a good point. Let me ask you a question. And I think I know what the answer is. We can't ask anyway. So I know that you're a fan of the classics and we're going to get into your excellent song list in a second here. But do you believe in albums and and the flow that an album has? For sure. I I do. And even if the artist didn't think they were putting together a flowing album, they are subconsciously, you know, like, you know, like, how can you not, how can you not get away? How do you listen to like, even like, so one of my picks that that'll be coming up uh, on, I can't separate it from the next song on the album. And Mm -hmm. whenever I hear it, I hear that next song immediately and the feeling that it evokes. I think it means a lot, even if the artist is writing like a bunch of like, like an album like Revolver by the, mm-hmm. by the Beatles. It's mm-hmm. got so many different flavors on there. and But yet, they all work together to form an album. And, you know, to me, that's a, a good album. Like an album that there's a bunch of different flavors on, but you could pick out any song at any time and it works on its own. Yeah, and those bands, so you Beatles, Stones, like name it, each one of those records has an essence that's kind of all its mm-hmm. own. So when you're sitting around thinking, okay, what do I want to listen to? Like an album, you know, start to finish. Yeah. They all have kind of different flavors for me. You know what I mean? Like if I'm different thinking, colors, like, flavors. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that's yeah. that's how I pick. And that's what that album represents to me. I could never just listen to a series of songs and I don't know. I just you know, maybe that's just from being, you know, a music fan as a kid. I don't know, but that's how I see there it. There are there are caveats to it. I mean, uh, I'm gonna say Hank Williams and the Temptation. Mm. Hank Williams didn't really make albums per se. He made songs and he would put them out on country radio and you know, he was touring and, and drinking and doing his thing, but he never really made like an album. I, I don't think albums were like a real thing until like maybe mid fifties, sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Temptations were another one of those bands that were just putting out like killer single after killer single. Yeah. So I would say that their greatest hits are their albums. And for me growing up, you know, both those, the Temptations greatest hits and Hank Williams greatest hits were two of my favorite albums yeah. of all time. It's still an album. It's a collection of songs. Uh, but yeah, to the point of like the classic album era uh, until now. And I think it does still mean a lot. Like as an artist, you need to have a statement that, you know, like, so I, I put out an album, I put out a few singles. I know if someone wants to get into me and listen to my stuff, mm-hmm. they're going to check out a song. And if they dig it, they might check out another song. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to take the step of maybe listening to the album. Right. And, you know, if the album is no good, they're going to be like, ah, moving on. <laughs> you know because people have short attention spans nowadays right you got to kill that album it's got to be a good album yeah nowadays anyways oh absolutely man absolutely uh okay so that's a good segue into your tunes here man you've got some great songs we're gonna have a good time talking about these let's let's kick it off here actually with the raw nets and be my baby this song got talked about a lot on this show in the past as it should be I even wrote a song, uh, like in an old band called Be My Baby, you know, and I knew, and then I was like, what are you doing, man? That's the same song title as that song, but whatever, it, that doesn't matter. That song instantly teleports me to being a kid. Uh, I could be doing anything. That song, come on, and I'll be like, 
five or six in front of the record player. And just like all those feelings of nostalgia will come back instantaneously. It's great? such a heavy, heavy song. And that Phil Spector sound is the wall of sound is on it. Yeah. And, uh, and today I was listening to it and, you know, as with all great pieces of music, you always kind of notice something, even after you've heard it a thousand times. I was listening to that song today, just to kind of brush up on on the feeling of it. And of course, I was transported back, but I was wrapped up in the drummer on the song that I'd never been wrapped up in the drums on the song before. Mm. Like, of course, everyone knows it goes boom, 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 plap, boom, 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 clap. You know, it has that opening drum break and the middle drum break. But then listening to the song, he changes that. I never noticed it. And being a, a you know a musician and some that's into this stuff, I was like, oh, this dude is doing some cool stuff. He changes the pattern throughout the song for the choruses and the verses, and then on the last choruses, he changes it again, and he starts doing all these cool drum fills and rolls that I'm listening to, and I'm like, oh, this is where Keith Moon got his stuff from. <laughs> this is where Ginger Baker got these like kind of like wild, all over the place kind of fills. Yeah, because. If you live other than jazz music, no one was doing that kind of stuff in popular music. And to put that stuff in popular music, you know, how was how was Pete Moon thinking about that? He's got to hear it somewhere. Yeah. You know, if you listen to the outro of that song and the drums on it, you'll be like, oh, that makes perfect sense. That those are Keith Moody kind of drum fills. Yes, and Ginger Baker. That's a great reference there yeah. too. Yeah. 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 You know, I that's so cool that you say that because I love the genealogy, like just the idea of you know, where did they get that from? And then you kind of look a generation back. And, and if you look at the whole thing, you know, from the top down, you can see the path mm -hmm. across the musical yeah. generations. It's just so cool. Yeah, I know exactly where I stole something from that I stole <laughs> that, and that where that person stole it from and who that person stole it from. Like, right. and it just keeps going back and forth, you know, and you can look at it however you want. But, you know, you're just taking bits and pieces. I like Otis Redding's voice on this. I like the way Willie Nelson turned that phrase. I love the way, you know, Angus Young played on this record. Yeah. Let's mish that together, you know? But it's so true, right? It's, I mean, there's, o there's only 12 notes. Ah, oh, thank you for saying, that's my favorite quote. That's all you got to work with, right? A hundred percent. Eddie Van Halen used to say that all the time. Oh, did he? And he, yeah, and it used to put me at such ease at points in my life when I was, you know, learning my instruments and stuff and getting like, you know, freaked out about, you know, the grandiosity of music. Mm -hmm. And then I would come back to that quote and I'd be like, yeah, it's just 12 notes. It's just, you know, how you mix them up. And, and half of them are flats and sharps of the same notes. So I was like, oh, it's not so bad. It's so I can get a hold of this. Yeah. If someone like Eddie Van Halen can say that and he can make it sound that simple, it must be that simple. Mm -hmm. It really is. Next, the Black Crows sting me. Love this pick. Man, what a band. Yeah. That album, dude, the Southern Harmony is one of my favorite all time rockers. Yeah. Top to bottom, not a dud on there. And I was glad to hear on your podcast that it's also Steve Gorman's favorite album. That's right. Yeah. You had the pleasure of talking to that man. Oh, what a great drummer. This is good. But, you know, I always say the Black Crows are one of the most underrated bands in the last 30 years, but Steve Gorman is one of the most underrated drummers, I think, in the last so 30 years. So good, dude. Yeah. What a, what a killer drummer! What a groove player! Yeah. Monster groove. He's like a groovy. He's like the uh, a perfect mix of Ringo Starr and John Bonham. Oh yeah, yeah, you know? that's he's good. Got call. that heavy pocket of Bonham, but he's got these cool little creative things he does. Not that Bonham didn't, but the, these quirky little things that like uh, Ringo Starr would do yeah. that you instantly know. Oh, that that's a Steve Gorman drum fill. Yes. Yeah, that album changed stuff for me. Like, you know, Shake Your Money Maker was. Obviously, you know, what an amazing album as well, right? But it was very, for me, it was still like I was into the faces, I was into the stones. You know, it was kind of like a continuation of that kind of vibe for me, and I, and I loved it, and I still love it. Yeah. But when Southern Harmony came out and that first song dropped on the album, it was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> this is like all that stuff, but it's their own, like, this is their thing. This yeah. is them 100%. And the mix of that album, you can hear Rich in one speaker, you can hear Mark Ford in the other, Ed Harsh in one, who I used to bump into on the streets of Toronto all the time, oh, which wow. is a cool story. Yeah, because he lived here, right? And uh, and then the gospel singers, Steve Gorman's drums, the percussion, it's such, it's my go-to mix for referencing uh, to producers when I want my stuff mixed. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything sounds so warm and good. Like the guitars are not too loud, but they're loud. 
the bass, the drums, everything works together, yeah. but it's, you can pick everything apart easily. So it's, it's my go-to reference. Like, what do you want it to sound like? I'm like, make it sound like Southern harmony. <laughs> yeah, you, you're right. You know, and you listen to those old stones records, you can hear, you can isolate the instruments kind of one by one in your head. You know, if you listen to those, mm-hmm. Um, through you know a left channel right channel and the crows records are, are the same they're very clear very crisp but they don't they're not homogenized you know there's still a, a good deal of warmth in those records yeah and they made that album in what eight days or something like that mm-hmm. like everything live off the floor and that song man it's such, such a great album opener the, i like that the lyrics are kind of like you know esoteric but they still have have like a meaning to them you oh, know yeah, yeah. Uh, He's not really talking about any one specific thing, but it's got this cool flavor, the call and response with the gospel singers. And just when you think it can't go any higher, Mark Ford rips you a new one with that guitar solo. Oh, I know. <laughs> and then they have the bridge come in after the solo, which I love, and the bridge takes it to another level. And then they come back for another outro course, and, and Chris is just ripping all over that. And then, of course, I can't separate it from that feedback note that goes right into Remedy. But, yeah. you know... You kind of have to when you just listen to the one song, but and right away that song gives me goosebumps as soon as it comes on. Ah, oh, that's a good feel good rock song, hundred percent. I like that you make note of the arrangement of that song because you're right, it is cool the way that they yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw them live at the Opera House back in the day. I don't know if you got to go to that show and they uh, they called themselves the OD Jubilee Band. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a secret quote unquote secret show, and they played the Opera House. Ronnie Wood came out on stage and played with them. Wow. And uh, we we snuck up to the balcony. Had, we were right behind the kids in the hall. We're right in front of us. Wow. It was just us and the kids, me and my four buddies and the kids in the hall and the crows. Yeah, Chris was pointing at us because we knew some of the lyrics from the new album, which was a at the time. What a great band because, you know, growing up, like, you know, all the rock, classic rock bands that I loved were gone. But, like, these guys came along and was like, oh, shit, they look like them. They sound like them. They probably smell like them, and uh, <laughs> but they're doing their own. This is their thing. As much as I loved all the music that came before, you always want to have something that you can feel, you can connect to in your own time, you know, whatever that may be. And the Crows were that for me. Yeah, I've said that a million times. You know, this is this music is for me. Like, and I think that this was yeah. these guys and and Guns were probably the 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 last two bands that wrote music for me. And you know, before grunge came in and stuff like that, just based on my age and. I felt like the Black Crows was my faces and my stones. 100%. Yeah. What, yeah, what a great band. I, I love them. I love them to this day. You know, that would be my dream opening gig would be, you know, the Crows. And, and I know Chris and Rich are going out, and it's, you know, unfortunately Steve's not with them. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they can work that all out, and uh, they'll let me open up for them. So sh- shout out, guys, if you need an opener. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, it's it, this is a fantastic record, you know. Like I gravitate to Amorica just a little bit more, just because I, I kind of feel like that's their physical graffiti. And I was saying that to Gorman that like it's just more kind of varied and and there's a little bit of everything on there. But Harmony is 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 absolutely solid. It's a great great rock record. I agree with you, and I also agree with Gorman about Key Twenty Five London. <laughs> it wasn't my favorite track. And Downtown Money Waster was hit or miss. Sometimes, depending on the mood you're in, it was great. It was still a great, a good song, right? You know what's really funny about that, Nelson, that Downtown Money Waster, is that the vibe of that song on Amorica, the original version of it, is very... I like the vibe of it because it's just super loose and, and you can tell they're just screwing around, right? There's drinks clinking in the background and stuff. and Yeah, but it's got that great, like, do-do-do, you know? And then what they did after is they uh, went back and I, I think it's Crowology that they, they wrote the yeah. song and put like bluegrass fiddles on it and stuff like that. Like, you know, when you hear that, you're like, ah, eh, maybe that won't work. But w- when you do hear it, it sounds fantastic. And I'm glad they did that. I think it's one of those songs that they weren't mature enough to play yet, mm-hmm. but kudos, kudos to them for writing it and attempting it. But like, I think for the Crows as a rock band, you know, they're trying to do all this stuff. And I think downtown New East was like, oh yeah, that's within our, our pocket. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. I don't think they had the uh, sensitivity at that time yet to yeah. to grab it. So maybe by chronology, that's why they they're like, oh yeah, this is how it should have been, and they nailed it then. But still, what, like what a what a great song, what a great band. Like Ed Ed Harsh's piano on descending. That if that doesn't bring you to tears, man, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what's wrong with you. 
I used to bump into that guy because he lived in Toronto, and he was the nicest man. He was exactly the cartoon character that you think he is, <laughs> in, in the best in the best way. Yeah. I'd like I'd be walking down Bathurst Street, and Ed Harsh would be walking towards me, That's crazy. and I'm like, "Hey, man, Ed Harsh," uh, uh, you know, and like uh, you instantly turn twelve or whatever, yeah. and uh, I'm like, "Hey, man, Ed Harsh, how you how, how you doing?" He, He's like, hey man, how's it going, man? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're you're he's like, I'm like, it's at ours. He's like, where do I know you from, man? Do I know you from somewhere? What are you talking about? Like, I know you. You're Ed Harsh. You're the <laughs> keyboard player for the crows. Like, I know you, dude. You don't know me. He's like, right on, man. All right, cool, man. And this happened like not just once, like two or three times. And he was always so kind to me. Wow. What a shame that he passed. And uh Shout out to Ed Harsh. Whose keys on Sting Me, by the way, that, that rosy electric piano that he's playing on there? Oh, Whew. yeah. So. It's like a little funky thing he throws in there. He was he was such a killer. Love oh, God, man. yeah. Yeah. Oh, we could do a, a full episode just on the crows. 100%. Let me know when you want to do that one. I'll be in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a feeling you, you're going to come back. I'd love to. All right. Um Next, Willie Nelson, Can I Sleep mm. in Your Arms? Great pick again, man. Yeah, unfortunately not a song Willie wrote, but mm. he definitely made his own. The original Can I Sleep in Your Arms uh, by uh, Jeannie Seeley, I believe her name is, and uh, he sings in the course, Can I Sleep in Your Arms Tonight, Mister? Mm. <laughs> and it's when Willie sings Can I Sleep in Your Arms Tonight, Lady, mm. it, uh, it takes on a completely different meaning. Willie sounds so like not that he doesn't on other stuff, but he sounds so genuine and, and honest about wanting needing to sleep in his lover's arms that night. Yeah, that it's it it just crumbles you inside. Not many singers are more believable than Willie Nelson. You know, I don't know why he's not recognized as one of the better singers of all time. I get it. He's got like this high reedy voice that maybe it's not a Ray Charles voice or. And Aretha Franklin, like it doesn't knock you off your socks, mm -hmm. but he snakes his way into your heart. And the way he turns phrases with his, with his vocal is nothing short of magical. He makes certain vowels sound certain ways. And it, I just get lost in his phrasing all the time. And I love his voice so much. The fact that he has a son that is following in his footsteps that sounds just as legit and amazing, but has his own voices. Again, nothing short of incredible. Like, what a what a powerful seed of music that Willie has planted in his heart that he's you know been able to you know move it forward as well with his progeny. Well, that's it. He just seems to have this groove that nobody else has. You know, it's a simplicity thing. It's just the believability thing. It, nobody is like him. There's a video. I don't know if you remember Willie Nelson had like a birthday bash a video uh, where he had all these people come on. It was like on HBO or whatever. No. And everyone like everyone did like a Willie. So like Errol Smith does a Willie Nelson song. Like <laughs> everybody, great. Christina Aguilera, all these people like, you know, and he joins them. Right. There's one part where it's man, Willie's crying. You're crying after watching it. Yeah. It's so heavy. It's Leon Russell on one side on a piano. Willie Nelson standing in the middle just standing there with a the microphone with nothing yep. just standing there and ray charles on another piano to his left and leon russell starts playing your song that he wrote and then willie nelson also covered that and had a hit with it and then ray charles also covered that and had a hit with it and then ray charles takes over on the second verse of that song and he just destroys all sensibility of like keeping your composure wow. while watching it Willie starts crying and, you know, Ray Charles is just knocking it out. He's just like singing his ass off, playing oh, yeah. his ass off. Yeah. And like, you can feel the weight of the history of those two, you know, like these two iconic legends that yeah. have, you know, changed the landscape of music, you know, Ray Charles and Willie Nelson, how more iconic and legendary can you get than those two cats? Yeah. And uh, it's such a cool, I'll send you the link after so you can watch it on your own. I was going to say, enjoy I'd love it. to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I watch it once a year to make sure my heart's working. Oh, you know? that's awesome. I like that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. But everyone should go check out Where Has Stranger that this song is off of. I don't know how familiar you are with the record, but it's a creepy, <laughs> it's a it's a country opera record. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's based on the tale of the Red-Headed Stranger, which is a guy that goes from town to town with 
his dead lover's horse oh. by his side. <laughs> yeah, man, it's creepy. It's it's a concept album, but it's it's amazing. You don't understand, uh, you don't realize how creepy it is until you like really zone in on the lyrics and you're like, oh shit, he just murdered another person <laughs> in cold blood because they touched the horse. Wow. His ex lover's horse that he that he's taking with him from town to town. It's really creepy, but it's really beautiful. And the whole album is a masterpiece. This song, Can I Sleep in Your Arms, is nestled in the middle of it. It's a one part where I guess he's reminiscing about wanting to sleep in the arms of his dead lover. It's real heavy. The whole album is amazing. And um, yeah, everyone should go listen to it. Yeah, I'll check it out. Wow. Uh, Otis Redding is next. I love you more than words can say. Another great pick. I love Otis more than any other singer of all time, of any time, of any genre, of any type of music. I do not care. Uh, Otis is king for me. Awesome. And, and it doesn't mean that he's technically better than he was, but there's just something in his voice that is a direct arrow to my heart and my soul. And it doesn't matter what he's singing. It just, I'm instantly inside his essence. And uh, on this song, and Steve Cropper, his guitar player, is one of my all-time favorite guitar players. So that combination of, of Steve and, and Otis's voice and, and that guitar is nothing short of like magic. And this song, it's like a deeper cut. It's not as famous. But it opens with this classic Steve Cropper line, and it just drops into Otis moaning and groaning so heavily on this track that if you don't believe he loves you more than words could say, I don't know what's wrong with you. I've never heard him on be more uh, pleading and needing than he is on this song. And uh, as a kid, when I put on this song, it would freeze me all the time, and I didn't know why. And it was my mom's record. It's just sitting on the Doc the Bay album. Yes. And I would put it you know, the first song is sitting on the dock with Bay. Great. No problem. I got you. And then that song would come on next and the guitar line would hit me and then his vocal would come in. And I didn't know what to do with myself except stand in front of that album record player and just listen to it and not move. Yeah, I love Otis. But I, I think that's just his way. It's funny that you say that because I, I when I hear the song, I feel like I'm there when I listen to the beginning of the song because it, it's like there's an actual kind of interaction going on, you know? And mm-hmm. I was saying earlier that, you know, Willie Nelson's believable. Otis Redding is certainly a believable singer as well. I think honesty, and I don't want to say honesty is missing from today's music because I think that's bullshit. There's so many amazing artists out there. But I think it was easier back in the day because there was less people playing music, you know, less uh, ways to get your music out, blah, blah, blah. But they're still out there. I mean, you know, even if you go popular, you got Chris Stapleton. That honesty, I think, is missing from a lot of the popular artists. I think that's the difference. Um, yeah. You know, like what's being play- what's being fed to us, for better or for worse, I don't believe it as much. I don't believe that you feel that way. I don't believe that you went through that thing that you're talking about in that song. And I, for whatever reason, I, it just doesn't connect with me. And I, and I don't believe you. And, and as soon as I don't believe you, there's a disconnect. Yes, it sounds great. Yes, you sing great. Yes, it's, it's a really cool groove or whatever. But I don't care is the difference, right? And, and I'm, I'm not trying to, again, not trying to make a blanket statement against all current music because there's so much of it and there's tons of great stuff. On it. But Back in the day, you could put on the radio and you would hear Otis, the Beatles or whatever, you know, and you would believe them. Yeah, I I think you're right. And I think, you know, it has to do with and and something that you said a long time ago about, you know, paying your dues. It's important to pay your dues. I've always believed in that put your 10,000 hours in mantra that I I think that's important. I think a lot of artists today, just because everything is so front loaded, that that doesn't happen. And so the believability isn't necessarily there every time. I also host an open mic every Monday, uh, and I did that in person for six years at, at a bar down the street. It's one of the bigger open mics in the city of Toronto, 15 different open micers every night, every Monday night. You know, not to big myself up, but I would get asked, like, oh, what did you think? Uh, do you have any advice? Over and over again. And I will tell you this, that the talent level of the current crop of people, because we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're all learning from the people that come before us. So it's easy to go on YouTube and, and learn all these guitar parts and and learn how to sing properly you know all the information is there so the level of talent is way higher than it used to be but i think that that ten thousand hours like that playing that shitty gig that no one's there and that you figured out you figured out that little thing that you do with your toggle switch on your guitar or you learned how to move your cord to start i don't know whatever it is like those little moments of like being in the shit dealing with it and getting through it 
I think that's missing from today. You know, um, I think that real life experience is missing a lot of times from these current artists. Fully agree. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish off with something fun, man. This is a great tune. Howlin' Wolf and 300 Pounds of Joy. That song specifically, I learned how to vibrato on, on guitar because of that guitar line from Hubert oh. Sumlin. He plays that lick, you know, and it's got this sass and swagger to it. And Helen Wolf, man, did that guy put the fear into you. Like, he just sang with <laughs> such fire. Yeah. Every song, I, I, want, I see saw between that and Evil because he just sounds really evil on, on Evil and his voice is so cutting. But on 300 Pounds of Joy, it just swayed and swaggered like this New Orleans, like, drunken sailor. Yeah. And there's, there's horns on it, and the horns are playing this great line. And then Hubert Sumlin, who is, like, his secret weapon, stabs you with this guitar. Like, the horns do it. And he plays that line. And for me, it was, like, a laser. Because I was trying to figure out how Angus Young would go, you know, playing, like, these vibrato kind of. But yeah. it, it was, like... It's so big, it's so loud, it's so hard, you know, there's pyrotechnics going on. It's really hard to, to, to figure it out as a young guitar player. And that song, that line, it was like, oh, that's how you do it. That's how you vibrato. And, and that was a song I learned how to play vibrato on, on guitar. And it, everything I needed to know was in there. He lays a monstrous solo in the middle of it yeah. that is a perfect... It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. It tells a story, like you know, like every great solo does, like a George Harrison solo or Jim Hendrix solo. Oh, Helen Wolf is just sitting on top. I can I can picture him swaggering back and forth, singing this song, and you know, shouting, "Hoy, hoy, I'm the boy, and 300 pounds of heavenly joy." You know, <laughs> not giving a shit about anything and just telling the world how badass he is because he was, he oh, was yeah. the king. You know, yeah. This tune, I think, is is on um, the same record as Smokestack Lightning, right? Mm-hmm. Is it 60, 62, 63? I, I love Alan Wolf, man. It's just, it's, it is joy. When you listen to this stuff, you can hear the joy coming through the speakers. Yeah, and you hear these stories like, you know, Willie Dixon, his bass player, was, you know, a profound uh, writer of all these, these songs, these classic songs, you know, Smokestack Lightning. 300 pounds of joy, you know, a little red rooster. He wrote all these songs mm-hmm. and he was the bass player. Didn't sing lead. But the legend is that Helen Wolf didn't know how to read. Oh, I don't know how much of that is true, but that is, you know, it's very possible um, at that time and in that climate. And the legend is that Willie Dixon would whisper the lyrics into his ear while they were recording. No. Oh, wow. And, you know, it kind of makes it, it kind of makes a bit more sense for blue songs than it would for other because blue songs repeat the same line twice. That's right. Right. So you only got to do it twice a verse, you know, instead of every time. Right. Yeah. So I can kind of see it. It could kind of work, you know, and I've done it on stage. I've seen other people do it where you lean over and you tell, you know, you tell them the chords or you tell them yeah. the lyrics or whatever. So it, it totally can be done without anybody noticing. But the fact that it's being done on these classic life changing, earth shattering records if it's true, or even if it's not, the legend sounds great anyway. Yeah. But yeah, wow. and he's whispering these lyrics into him, and then he's singing them. And again, not because of that song uh, being true to Howlin' Wolf, but because Howlin' Wolf is true to the music. Mm-hmm. So whether or not he even has a little red rooster, you know, <laughs> yeah. he is so entrenched in his music and his being and his muse. You know, if Willie Dixon's singing that line into his ear for him to sing it, there is no stopgap between that and him emoting that honesty right through his vocals into your ears. That's right. Like you feel every single syllable that that man's singing every time. Yeah. Fantastic, man. So this, is a, this, is, a, this is a great list. Thank you, man. It changed the minute after I gave it to you, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As it does. I mean, uh, Watching the Wheels has been stuck in my head for several days by John Lennon. Oh, yeah. Uh, nice. That's a great tune. Yeah, and then I went down the John Lennon rabbit hole and I realized a bunch of his songs are written around the same chord progression. <laughs> yeah, like that song and Imagine. Being a songwriter, you, you'll you write songs and, and you're like, oh no, I can't do that again, you know? Yes. I can't write, I can't put those same two chords together. And that song sometimes is good and sometimes it's bad because it's stopping you from writing just a great song yes. because of your hangups or whatever. And I like that even later in his career, he still did it and he didn't give a shit. He wrote Imagine and uh, Watching the Wheels, and the verses are exactly the same chord progression to a certain extent, right? So, yeah, the power of music goes beyond your 
silliness of, of your concepts of like what you can and cannot do. That's it, man. That's it. Yeah, brother. Well, listen, thank you so much, Nelson, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I've, ad- I've enjoyed this chat, man. Like you and I see things very, very similarly. Thank you, man. I- I'm sorry for talking too much, but you, you, you made me pick songs that I love and I got all excited and <laughs> That's a- I just talked too much, man. I'm really sorry. <laughs> hey, don't be sorry, man. That's what the show's about. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. And, uh, you know, get five more together. I expect you to come back. Oh, I will. In June, July, I'll have a screaming baby in the background. And another hot single for you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Uh, Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. All the best to you and yours. Yeah, absolutely. The new single is called Pendulum. Now available everywhere. Check it out. Nelson, are we going to roll the air here? Sobral. Ooh. Did I do got it? Me. Yeah. Totally got it. There we go. I, I, got, I nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you so much, man. Oh, uh, Brian, such a pleasure to talk to you, man. Thanks for humoring me and, and putting up with my yapperin'. No problem. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, brother. Have a great day. Cheers. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Nelson Sobral. Till next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide. 